The Fundamentals of Starting a Successful Law Firm with Mark Rockwell, Episode 285. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit-generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I have a treat for you. It is a, uh, a coach, somebody who works in the trenches with entrepreneurs, with law firm owners to help them exceed, help them excel, su- excel, succeed in growing their law firm practice. Sorry for my tongue twisting there. We're not editing that out. We do a one and done here. Um, my guest today is Mark Rockwell. Uh, he owns the company Coach Rockwell, and he is a lawyer and entrepreneur, helps frustrated attorneys build healthy, thriving law firms. I'm really excited to have this conversation because this, that, this is what I do, right? And Mark seemingly does what I do. And I, I, I love to see how other people are approaching this process. I love to see how they're supporting their clients. What are the things that they're finding that their clients are struggling with? Is that the same or different than what I find my clients are struggling with? And ultimately, how do I unlock Mark's beautiful mind for you guys to really uh, just to, you know sit and 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 drink at the fountain of knowledge that he has acquired over over the years. So I'm excited to get into this conversation with him. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's my absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. I'm sure that we're going to uncover some real golden nuggets for our listeners, and I can't wait for that to happen. Uh, What I like to do at the beginning is give you a real easy question to answer because it's your story. You know it. Um, Our listeners don't know, you know, many of them don't know who you are. Maybe some of them do. Um, But uh, for the ones who don't, um, and even for the ones who do, who may not know your journey, tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, running a coaching business and um, and and why why lawyers uh, as a as a target market? Well, briefly, uh, I'm a lawyer by background. Even though I've spent much of my career as an entrepreneur, starting and growing businesses, uh, I went to law school, passed the bar in the state of Washington. Have done a lot of legal work over the years, mainly for the companies that I have uh, developed and owned. And during my uh, last business that I started in 2007, which was a healthcare company, we were actually introduced to the EOS process, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And I realized what a profound difference that had in the way we grew our company. And I frankly wished I had been introduced to it 20 years earlier. So when I sold that business and I realized I had no interest in retiring, I decided that I would share that information, that knowledge with other uh, young aspiring businesses. And it wasn't long I was getting calls from people who knew me who were attorneys saying, hey, could you help us? And what I recognized was that uh, once you lift the hood on most law firms, there's plenty of opportunity for organizational improvement. So that's actually a real, in a real brief form, how I got started. Awesome. I love, um, I love your journey uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, number one, I mean, this is something that sets me apart from, from others in the industry is, is uh, I am not a lawyer. Um, and, uh, you know, often I get asked like, okay, so if you're not a lawyer, then why are you, you know, uh, teaching lawyers how to, uh, how to grow their practice? Like, what do you know of about, about the law and, and legal, you know, legal practice. And, you know, my response to that is, well, you don't have to be a lawyer to know how to run a business, but you do have to know how to run a business to make money as a lawyer. Right. So, um, and, uh, I love that you are both right. You are a lawyer. You do have that insight into, uh, what 
is involved in uh, the practice of law, but at the same time, you're also an entrepreneur. You've gone through, you've been in the trenches and building other businesses, not necessarily a law firm, but other businesses. And therefore you've, you've learned the lessons. You know, there's a lot of lessons that we learn as we grow our businesses. And there's a, you know, one of my coaches um, always tells me, you know, you can, you can read a book on how to swim and you can read it multiple times. You can be an expert at it. You could be asked every question possible on that book and score hundred every single time. But until you get in the water, you don't know how to swim. Well, that's and absolutely true. And, and you know, quite honestly, of, of my background, if you said to me, well, what's the most important your training as, or my training as a lawyer or my experience as a business person, without a doubt, it's my experience as a business person. Uh, what I help attorneys understand uh, the skill sets, if you will, are pretty industry agnostic. Uh, the fact that I am an attorney by training, probably if nothing else, uh, means that I'm, I kind of think like a lawyer. Uh, so from a personality and thought process, that probably is as important as anything, as opposed to any technical knowledge I have about law. Yeah, absolutely. Um, love that. So in the green room, before we started, we started to have a conversation and, and it turned to this idea or this, the, you know, this concept of, you know, they're not really teaching the business of law, they're not really teaching how to run a practice, practice management, uh, you know, managing a practice, any of that in law school. And uh, by and large, most law schools don't have that in as even as an option in the, in the curriculum of courses that you can take. And a lot of people who start their law firm hide behind that. They're like, well, they didn't teach business in law school. And that's kind of like a, fl a white flag that they hold to kind of like be their excuse of, you know, why I haven't made it further than I have in this process. And uh, myself and, and Mark in included are out there to try and, and flip the script for you and to try to help you um, not have to have that as your excuse. We want to educate you to, um, to be a business owner to to be making decisions from that from that place, and um, one of the th one of the problems that I find, and and I think there's you know when you're sitting on the outside looking in, it's easy to see the problems, right? It's easy to see where things are are wrong, and I promise you, Mark, there is a question here. So, <laughs> one of the problems that I see in the legal industry is really it's a similar problem in a lot of other places. It's that Today, in today's day and age, it's so easy to start a business. You can literally, for a hundred bucks or less, buy a domain name, put a website up there, get a phone number, and tell people you're open for business, and that's it. You're done. Like you can go and serve clients. And because it's so easy to open a business, lawyers are starting a law firm with this assumption that. All I need to do is put in the sweat equity and I will have the results from it. And the reason that I think that's a problem, uh, and, and this is where the question is going to come, Mark, because I want to know your opinion on it. I believe that um, a lawyer needs to view their position differently. When a doctor goes to open a, a, a doctor's office, they have no choice but to outfit an office where they can see patients. They have to buy expensive machinery. They've got to buy examining tables. There's a, there is an outlay of capital that they need to invest in that business before they see the first patient. And I'm not necessarily saying that lawyers need to have that outlay of capital before they see the first client. But I do believe that if you want to accelerate your success, that you have to be ready and willing to deploy capital in the growth of your firm to be able to bring on the team members necessary, to be able to handle the workload necessary to really create success for yourself. Uh, there's only so far you can go as a solo and, and the, the quicker that you can get out of that mode of I'm gonna do everything to I'm gonna have other people do everything is really what the key is to me to unlocking real success in your firm, being able to, to control your time and, and, and have something to show for it. So Mark, my question to you is, is what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you do, uh, do you share that opinion? Do you uh, do you have a contrasting opinion? Where do you sit in this? You know, people doing things by themselves versus hiring others to do it, deploying capital. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, let me go one click back from that question and say where I think this whole thought process started in law schools is that the capital you're referring to has for many years been considered your knowledge. 
In other words, your ability to succeed as an attorney was not a business. It wasn't even, it was considered a profession. And of course it is a profession mm -hmm. and less so today, perhaps than a generation or two ago, but many attorneys would take umbrage with the concept that a law firm is a business. They would, they would go humbug, it's a profession. And so if you label it that way, if you think of it that way, what you're, what you're saying in your mind is it's not really a business. It's all what's between my ears that's going to determine my success or my failure. It's my ability to research. It's my ability to write. It's ability, my ability to speak. It has nothing to do with the capital in my business. It no, has nothing to do with my profit and loss. And we all know that that's really patently false. And so it's as a well, I want to stop you for one second, because it's not false, right? It's true. If you're an attorney, um, many of you have, have read the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber, and he, he, he makes this distinction between yes. the technician and the business owner, right? So as a technician, meaning the attorney, right? The attorney is the technician in this example, right? Um, as the person doing the legal services work, that is a profession. And that is the knowledge between your ears. But if you want Correct. to run a law firm and be a business owner in that process, the longer that you see yourself as the technician, that you see yourself as the professional, the more you'll be impeding your growth is where, it, 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 did I get that right, Mark, with what you were oh, trying totally. to- Totally, yes. To and I was, really, I was really talking in the concept of someone who's made the mental jump from technician to business owner but in fact, they haven't emotionally embraced it. They, they, they right. want to be that business owner, but they haven't made the intellectual jump from being the technician to acknowledging that, yes, they are a technician, but they're also a business owner. Absolutely. And so in that regard. Yeah, so, so, so that's the first, the first step is to really recognize that, hey, if I continue to hold on to this as a profession, then I'm going to be severely limiting the possibility of what I'm able to do. And if a person really uh, enjoys that and embraces that exclusively, they probably need to be a practitioner in a, log in a larger firm where other people are making the business decisions. Right. Or, or there's room. I mean, you can still own your own firm and sit in the seat of the technician and just hire somebody to be the CEO. Right. You can bring somebody in to run the business for you. A lot of lawyers have, you know, they bring in an office manager, which who's really running the day-to-day the -day operations for them and they're out there practicing law. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, not at all. But you, you'd you have to be very careful that you didn't subvert the, the management of the firm by maintaining a, a philosophical attitude that was in, in, inconsistent with that. Yeah, agreed, agreed, absolutely. Okay, so so now back to the question of, of capital. Now that we've we've gone back and, and established that, you know, hey, we've got to overcome this emotional attachment to the profession and recognize that there isn't something wrong with calling it a business. There isn't something wrong with being a business owner. And another thing is being in the pursuit of profit, right? Um, uh, I have a client of mine um, who shall rename nameless for, for this podcast, but they know who I'm talking about. Um, I send out a planner every quarter um, for my, my coaching clients. And we use that planner in being able to execute on the plan that we, that, that we design. And I had the planner personalized with Profit With Law logo right on the cover. And this particular client has asked, hey, can you send me a planner without the Profit With Law logo? Because I don't want people to see me carrying that planner around and think that I'm, after, I'm in the pursuit of profit. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because why, why would you want to hide that? Why would you would want, you want somebody to think, think you weren't trying to profit? Right. Why would you want somebody <laughs> to think that you're not in this for, for you know, for, for making a profit? Like, what does that say about you? Do uh, you really think that clients coming to your law firm are, are not expecting you to make money? In fact, the truth is most of your clients or most of the clients would assume that you're making probably far more profit than you actually are. As, as you and I were this talking beforehand, many law firms are not profitable. And I can darn well promise you the clients don't think that. Right. The client, I don't think that, you know, honestly, I think that, that the lawyers can do a, a better job in communicating with clients 
everything that their firm is doing so that they really understand that it's not, because especially if you have the billable hour model, they're looking at the lawyer and saying, oh my gosh, I'm paying you 450 an hour. You know, I'm doing some quick math in my head. You're baking a boatload of cash. But the reality is, is that no, you know, the money, the revenue that the attorney is bringing in, you know, maybe 20% of that is going to pay for that attorney's salary. And then another 20% is going to pay for their support staff. And then 20% is going to pay for overhead. You know, before you turn around, there, there isn't a ton left for the firm to be making money. And I think that um, it, it might not be a bad idea. I haven't really explored this. This is the first time I'm saying this out loud, but it might not be a bad idea for you in the, sta- in the, in the initial stages of, of getting a client to show them what is involved in, in the law practice. Be- so to make them understand that, hey, look, just because we're going to be billing an hourly fee for our attorney, uh, we want you to understand that that hourly fee is not just covering the attorney's time. It's covering all these other things, you know, that we have in place for you to be able to provide you the best client experience possible. Um, and I think if we did that, it probably would help get bills paid better for sure. Well, I, as I said earlier, I can promise you, because I've been on the, on the receiving end many times, having paid many hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal bills over the, my career, uh, having run businesses. And, you know, when you get a $40,000 bill, uh, you're assuming that the law firm has done very handily. And in fact, that isn't always the case. I, I, do, I do agree with you that I think educating clients on what's involved in actually producing the finished product probably would be a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, we, we, still have, we still haven't got to the, to the crux of the question that I asked you. And I'm curious to know, you know where, where you sit on this, on this conversation or, or how you would encourage people to think about it. Um, so when, when you're approaching the, 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 the starting or the growth of, of your law firm, um, where does the capital come from? And, and you know, is this sweat equity the right way to go or, or are there investments to be made? Um, and when should somebody consider making a financial investment in their firm? Well, it, it, the answer is some money needs to be invested right up front. Uh, you certainly aren't going to be able to just open a office without an investment. And certainly case management software, the proper high-tech equipment, um, being able to have proper accounting in place. There's a fair amount of investment that is required. Now, it's nothing like a doctor's office, I must say. And, and I think that an attorney, especially if they start out relatively small as a single practitioner, can keep the investment relatively small, but it certainly isn't, it, it isn't free. Uh, but mm-hmm. I would anticipate that an attorney who is going to start their own law firm should be able to not only carry their own salary for a period of six months to a year, but probably needs to be able to set aside at least twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars for other types of equipment, software, systems, processes. Okay. Now, wh- what about later on in the growth of the firm? I mean, one of the things that I find my clients struggle with a lot is when to hire staff, um, and they already know that they need to hire somebody when that conversation is starting. But they are in this mindset of looking at the past to make the present decision. So they'll look at that and say, well, we're generating $250,000 in revenue. I need to be bringing home $100,000. The other $150,000, you know, 80, 90% of it is already spoken for between rent, software, uh, malpractice insurance, and, you know, this, that, and the other are, are, you know, professional services or accounting fees and, you know, bookkeeping and all that stuff. And now I turn around and I, I, I need to hire somebody and I'm making a decision to spend, you know, 50, 75, $100,000 a year on somebody's salary. And they're looking at where they're at and saying, I can't afford this. If I do this, I'm going to have to not pay myself and I might even be losing money every month. So how do you help your clients work through that process? Fortunately, in an era of virtual, it is easier than it used to be because an, an, an aspiring attorney has the ability to access online help 
that they probably would not have had access to even as recently as three or five years ago. And so having a virtual assistant can at least be a, a baby step in the process of offloading a, a variety of administrative tasks. A great little book, which you're probably familiar with by Dan Sullivan, uh, is uh, Who Not How. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And that is something that we all need to take to heart because we all hear in the back of our mind, our mother's voice saying, just learn to do it yourself. Why you could just do that yourself. And so there is that voice. Plus there is the thought that, well, I can just do this. It'll only take 20 minutes. Well, I can do this. It'll only take a half an hour. But the fact is by the end of the week, we've spent 10, 15, 20 hours on a, a lot of administrative tasks that should be far better executed by somebody else. So I would encourage uh, an individual to sit down early on in their practice and keep very careful track of how they're spending their time, particularly on how many administrative tasks are eating up time out of their week, which could be bundled and offloaded to somebody at a fairly modest rate, probably not more than 25 or $30 an hour that translates to another 15 or 20 hours a week of billable time that that attorney could be putting in. So I think it's a pretty uh, clear trade-off once you start to do the analysis. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the key part of what you just shared is the last part where you said, well, you know, if you hand off this work to somebody else, now you've just unlocked 10 to 15 more hours of billable work and somebody sitting in the seat will be like, well, I'm doing all the billable work now. My phone's not ringing off the hook. So I don't see where that billable work is going to come from. And I think that's the biggest mindset shift that needs to happen is to recognize that the reason that you don't have that work right now is because you don't have the capacity. And subconsciously, there are things that you're doing in your business that you're not taking efforts in marketing. You're not working hard to close a sale. You're not calling people back after a consult because you don't have capacity to serve them. So you're going to put roadblocks in place to not make those, the, not get those clients. And the reality is, is once you have that additional capacity, now you can fill it. So you're going to, you're going to get those clients. And, you're absolutely you know, so it, right. Yeah. You got it. You got to take it on faith that that's going to happen. And there's, there is a certain amount of, of trust that you need to have in the process to make that happen. Speaking of, of VAs, one of uh, the companies that we partner with a ton is uh, Get Staffed Up. You, folks, you can go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash Get Staffed Up to get more information. Um, and Get Staffed Up has offshore VAs that are in your time zone, um, you know, English speaking, well-educated uh, individuals, and you can have a full-time VA for $1,850 a month. So, I mean, that's just an incredible uh, asset that you can put into place. Uh, and I agree with Mark 100%. That's where you should be start. You should be starting to hire from the bottom, uh, from the least expensive employee and hand off the least, the, the least um, challenging piece of work on your plate and just keep working that way until the, you know, the, the VA's plate is full. And then you can say, okay, what's the next step? Is it another yay is it is it a a in-house full-time person or part-time person is it a paralegal is it an outsourced paralegal where i'm getting fractional services there's a lot of options that you have as a matter of fact i recently did a talk so we did an annual planning event uh, just um, when we're recording this it was just last week but when this gets released it'll be it'll probably have been last month or the month before but we in the end of december we did a planning event and on day number three I did a talk specifically on this, on uh, on, on outsourcing um, or, or growing your staff on any budget. And I went through a lot of these options that you have that are not necessarily the traditional, hey, I'm going to go and hire an attorney, um, you know, next. Uh, but, I, but no matter which one of these options you choose, it's going to require some capital. It's going to require you to make an investment that may not make financial sense based on your past history but you have to be able to predict the future. And I don't mean in the most optimistic light, but in like, you know, hey, if things just kind of go well, kind of, kind of situation and see that the math works and then you need to just have enough cash to allow that to happen. Um, so whether it's, you know, whether it's putting that funding into place or whether it's saving or what, you know, whatever it is, 
you need to be able to make moves like that. You need to be able to invest in your firm to be able to take that next step in growth. Um, and I use the example of hiring a staff member, but it could be, hey, I don't know if I'm ready to hire a marketing agency. Well, guess what? If you have bandwidth for new clients and you don't have a good marketing plan and so far you just winged it, then you know it's going to cost you two, $3,000 a month. But do you want to not invest that because you don't have that money right now? Like, does that, does that even make sense to, you know, to, to hold back your growth because, because of 30 grand, you know, over the course of a year? Um, you know, I think that's where uh, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of error that's happening in the industry. Well, you know, what you described uh, makes perfect sense. And I was thinking, as you were speaking, we talk about going on a journey. Well, capital for this journey is no different than putting fuel in your tank. You would never consider leaving New York City and heading to Pennsylvania on an empty tank. If you, it would be ludicrous to think that you're going to drive a couple hundred miles, but you're going to start out with only enough gas in your tank to take you to the edge of town. Anybody that was at all rational would say, well, I've got to at least put in 15 or 20 gallons here. And so it really is no different in a law practice. It doesn't mean that you have to put a half a million dollars in but you do have to have at least sufficient funding so that as you success as you actually begin to even achieve success you have the ability to build on that success and that requires capital yeah i would argue that if you had a half million dollars on day 1 when you started you probably would spend it on the wrong thing so there's a, there's 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 a curse and a blessing to this conversation right it's like you don't want to have too much capital at the beginning when you don't know what you don't know but you also as you grow you don't want to be making decisions based on, can I afford this or not? You wanna be making decisions based on what does this make possible for me? And then how am I gonna pay for it should be the second part of that equation and not can I afford it, but how am I gonna pay for it? You know, the who, who not how <laughs> book, when it comes to money, you gotta figure out the how, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, but even there, who not how, go find somebody who can help you with financing solutions, go help somebody who can help you find money in ways that you didn't think that you had access to it. Uh, you know, there's programs, there's the SBA, there's things like that where you can get access to capital and, you know, be able to put that to work um, to, to really grow your firm. And, you know, it, it's, people are, are, are debt averse, but at the same time, they're racking up their credit card in the process, right? Like, you know, it just doesn't make sense that you're willing to, to put money on a credit card at 15, 20, 25% interest and try to figure out, oh, how am I going to pay it later? And you're not willing to take out a $150,000 loan at 6% interest so that you can actually hire somebody, bring on a marketing agency, and all of a sudden you turn around and now you're a million dollar firm instead of a $250,000 firm. So you know, I really, I, I think that we, some, what is, what's the term we cut off our nose in spite, to spite our face, right? It's like, it, we really need to get smart when it comes to the growth of our business. And um, I, I think that capital is a big piece of it, but honestly, it's, there's a lot that you need to have in place before you start thinking about capital. And I think that for the rest of the time that we're together, which uh, we're, I see we're, we're eating up the clock really quick. M Mark, what, what do you think is the, uh, the place where somebody should get started, even if they're, they've been running their firm for 10 years, if they're finally ready to say, hey, how, how do I treat myself like a business owner and, and start to, to really um, achieve success beyond what I've, what I've been able to do so far? Well, to answer your question, uh, I think it, it is a, a mental shift to say, I really am running a business. What are, the, what are the basic fundamental concepts that I need to make sure we're following if we're going to run a business and run it successfully? And when I first of all meet with a, a client, I always talk in terms of what I refer to as the four achievements. Uh, and I, I came up with a, a simple acronym because it's easy for me to remember, and I call it FACE, F-A-C-E. Uh, most acronyms I forget because they don't make sense, but I can remember FACE. And so the four achievements are really, number one, focus, as in F. Focus is something that virtually every profession, every bright person, every entrepreneur suffers from. Because if you're a bright, talented person, we tend to be attracted by the bright, shiny object. So we need to learn to focus. 
the second achievement that we need to really work on very diligently is accountability. When you have people in your staff um, who are working alongside you, it really is important that each of us understand what we're accountable for. Without that, it's just mayhem. Thirdly is clarity. Uh, clarity is, is clarity as to what our values are, what our purpose is, who our client is, what our target market is, what we're trying to achieve. And then lastly, achievement in execution. So if we can accomplish all four of those things, and that's where I start with every client is sitting down and saying, so how do we go about doing these four uh, concepts or four achievements, which is focus, accountability, clarity, and execution. And then there are various fundamental subsets or principles that we walk through to help accomplish those four. And, and it really isn't that complicated, frankly, but it's a matter of acknowledgement that these are important and taking a step-by-step -step process. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a really good point, which is that, you know, this is not difficult. You know, people tend to overcomplicate the process of being successful at business, and it's really not hard. The thing that's hard is overcoming your own beliefs and being willing to allow uh, latching on to something as this is the way to do it. And I think that uh, this is something that I come across with, with my own clients um, but I mean, the way that we get around this is by charging enough money that they, they pay attention. But the reality is, is that if you invest in a coach, if you, if you invest in somebody to say, Hey, look, I'm willing to learn something new, show me how it's done. You then need to buy into that process a hundred percent. And it's the, the friction and the resistance that happens when you don't buy into that that causes a lack of success. Now, whether, I mean, it, it could even be your own fundamental understanding of what you need to be doing. The problem is, is that, you know, like you said, when, you know, you lack focus because you're not sure that this is the right way to get to where you want to go. And therefore, every time that something else comes across, you're like, oh, maybe that's the way to do it. Maybe that's the way to do it. And all of a sudden you're, you're, you're jumping in a hundred different directions. Um, one of my, business coaches, um, you know, made this analogy and said, you, you're, you know, when you do that, you're just starting to build a whole bunch of bridges. What you need to do is build one complete bridge or you never get to the other side. And you do that by not starting the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, but instead staying focused on one thing completely, learning from your results, even if they're, even if they're negative results in your, in your uh, interpretation of them, but learning from that to make the next result a little bit better and a little bit better. And eventually that bridge gets completed and now you've got a successful business. Now you can think about adding another bridge. And I think that, um, you know, one of the best examples of this is practice areas. You know, like I, I can't tell you how many solo attorneys I run into that they're like in three, four, five different practice areas. You go to their website and it's like, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff that you do. And then you go to the about us page and it's one attorney and you're like, what? It just doesn't make any sense. And the reality is, is that's, that's the same thing. You're, focus, you're, you're, you're disseminating your focus amongst so many different things that you can't do any of them well. And you can't possibly achieve real success when you do that. You know, how, and how do you replicate that? Even if you become the, the, the master of all those different things, how do you then hire somebody else to do what you're doing? Who's going to well, come you in the door and have all five, six practice areas under their belt? If someone asked me, um, give me one pearl, and you can only give me one pearl, what would it be? I would say more than any other single piece of advice, it would be focus. Because unless and until a person is focused, nothing else really matters. Because you're just hopscotching from one thing to another. And as you were saying earlier, you're never going to achieve success and because you never achieve success, you're going to probably keep hopscotching to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, not recognizing that it's actually the lack of focus and follow through that is causing you to have repeated failures. If you would just settle down in one area of law, even if it wasn't an area of law that you necessarily loved, if you just focused on it, probably over time, you would become successful. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so yeah, I think the, the, we're bringing up some really good points, and and you know you and focus is is, is a key to it, which is the first of uh, in your acronym. Um, what was the A standing for again? That was accountability. Uh, accountability. Right? Yeah. And, so and I mean, you painted accountability as as you know everybody being accountable for what they're responsible for. So really clarity in, in, in the division of responsibilities and, and who, who's responsible for what. Um, but what about the owner's accountability for, you know, taking the action that they've determined they need to take in order to achieve results? Um, what, what recommendation do you have for our listeners on how they can stay accountable to themselves? Well, I think that the, there's several things that need to be done. One is it needs to involve very clear goal setting. It needs to also involve clear weekly acknowledgement as to where they are on their uh, journey. And, you know, you can't just set a goal on January 1st and then check back on December 31st. The most successful method for holding yourself and holding your colleagues accountable, in my opinion at least, is having a weekly check-in recognizing what you committed to last week, what's been accomplished and what you're committing to for the following week. We oftentimes, well, I should rephrase that. I believe most failures are the result of no cadence, no rhythm, no follow through. We, we commit to something and then three months later we check back. Well, surprise, surprise, nothing's been done. And so I would say that a owner uh, or if there are multiple principles, having a weekly check-in meeting and gauging it against their goals and then recommitting e individually as to what they are going to do the following week, it's surprising in three weeks, three months, in a year, those goals will have been achieved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan, a big proponent of, of chunking down the work that needs to be done into, into quarters. But I think it, it starts with the first thing that you said, which is to, you know, to have a weekly check-in with yourself. You know, how many, how many people are doing that right now? You know, listeners, you're listening to this podcast. Are you, is that something you're doing? Right? Are you checking in weekly to, to measure your progress, see how you're doing? I think we, we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day activities of what we're doing that um, the days go by and we don't realize how much time has gone by. And all of a sudden it's, it's like, okay, now it's, you know, uh, Easter is here and now it's the summer and now it's fall and now it's, you know, oh, Christmas is here. And you look back, you're like, holy crap, a whole year went by. And do we make progress? Yeah, maybe we went up a couple of percentage points or whatever, you know, like, but there's, you're not experiencing the real significant growth that's possible because you're not paying attention, you're not doing that check-in. And, um, you know, if you, if you set your intention and know how, to, how you're going to get there and then check in along the way, you can make the tweaks necessary. Um, a perfect analogy for this is if a plane takes off in Los Angeles heading for New York, and then it's off by one degree, you know, it, that one degree difference will end up putting it somewhere in like Florida or something. I don't know the exact, the exact uh, uh, math of how, you know, where it would end up, but it would be significantly off course. And what happens is, is that that does happen in flight, right? The wind is pushing against the plane. Those, those, those um, veering off course is something that happens regularly. The pilot's job is to continue to put the plane back on course over and over and over again throughout the process. Now they have autopilot and all that stuff that's doing it for them. But the reality is, is that you, you have to do these course corrections in order to make sure that you're in, on, in target online for where you wanna go. And if you don't make those course corrections every single week, what's gonna end up happening is, is you're gonna end up at a completely different destination than where you intended to go. Um, so I think it's, you know, um, it's almost about being intentional with where you're heading. One of the best books I've read in the last couple of years is called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And one of the secrets in the book is that you have weekly check-ins. And you don't just beat people up on the team. You ask each individual to volunteer what they're going to get done the next week. And mm -hmm. it is this cadence. It is the cadence of check-in. It is the cadence of each individual saying what they are going to do the next week. And then the following week, they check back in as to what they actually accomplished. So it is my saying, I'll mow the lawn 
the next week I have to say, well, actually I didn't get the lawn mowed. Well, uh, but this is what I'll do this next week. And so I am a real believer in that. And I know it works for me as well as other individuals. Uh, I always tell me my individuals that I coach, you know, this is not one and done. You, if you're, and it's not like buying it, buying a gym membership, or maybe I should say it is like buying a gym membership. You got to show up and you got to do the reps. Right. Right. If not, then you're just supporting the gym financially, <laughs> but you're not actually getting anything to show for it. <laughs> You'll stay just out, out of shape as, as you were before. Um, yeah, I love that. And, and it's, it's so true. And I, you know, I, uh, when we were running this planning event um, for the end of the year, I basically said, you know, the, the goal of this event is not to create an annual planning event. It's just that naturally a new beginning is a plan is a chance for you to do some introspection and figure out what you're going to do next. I said, but ultimately what we need to do is we need to help you figure out how to continue to work on this throughout the year so that you're not like the gym goer who's on January 1st, all gung ho. And I'm, I'm going to be here every single day. And then by mid February, they're all gone. There's nobody to be found. Like where'd they all go? And you know, the, that, that happens because you don't, you don't have buy-in to the process. You don't believe in the future result that you, that you're trying to achieve. Um, and if you ultimately believed in it and believed the process that you're taking would get you there, of course you would do it. Right. If I told you, this is, this is a surefire method to have, to have the winning numbers for the lotto. All you have to do is do this every day for the next 365 days. And when you get to the end of it, you will win the lottery. Right. If somebody believed that they'd be crazy to not do that every single day. The problem is, is that they're not going to believe it. They're going to doubt it. Or even if they believe it at the beginning, they'll be halfway through the year. And they'll be like, I, I don't believe this is going to happen. What am I doing that? Why am I even doing this? You know, and then they, they drop the ball forget about it, stop doing it. Um, and that's what, that's what we do in our business, right? You have to know where you're headed and how you're going to get there and believe it if you want to see success. Well, and to that point, it comes back again to the word focus. You know, one of the things that we're all, most of us are guilty of is we take on too much. We think, well, in the year 2022, these are the 16 things I'm going to accomplish. When in fact, we'd be far better off to say, this is the one thing in the year 2022 I'm going to correct, or these are the two things I'm going to get done in 2022. If a person can focus their energy on two and not more than three major accomplishments, not more than three. And they have a weekly cadence to measure their progress. By the end of 2022, I would venture to say all three of those items will in fact be successfully accomplished. What we tend as humans to do is create a list of 30 things, thinking that somehow if we have this big lengthy list some of those items will magically be accomplished. And yet, in fact, it so overwhelms us mentally that we don't accomplish any of them. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you 100%. And as a matter of fact, this is what I do with my clients, except that I do it by quarter, not annually. So um, we do have an annual goal, but then we look and say, okay, what is it going to take to achieve this annual goal? Oh, totally. What are all the major projects that we need to do? And then we don't want to take on more than one to three projects a quarter um, to be able to accomplish this over the course of the year. And uh, I don't know who's, who says this line. I, I use it all the time, but I don't give credit because I have no idea who's the one who said it. But we tend to um, under, overestimate what we could do in a day and underestimate what we can accomplish in a year. And this is really true because every day we start off with like, here's the 30 things I'm gonna to do today. And then you get to two of them and you feel really defeated. But at the same time, if you take one tiny little action towards this bigger goal, towards this bigger project every single day, and you do that consistently, all of a sudden at the end of the year, you get to look back and see, wow, look how far I've come. And I think that, you know, that's, that's really, the key it's like it's it's when you take that focus and the accountability you put it together um, and you start to take that action every single day um, and i look i'm a big proponent of having a plan right you need you need to know where you're headed in order to be to be able to get there like what action are you taking every day what is it like how do you know what how do you know what that action is supposed to be so there's some pre-work that you need to do in order to be successful with the focus and the accountability 
because if you're focusing on the wrong thing, then you're not going to, you're not going to get to where you need to go. So Mark, what, what do you, what do you do with your clients to, to help them plan and, and prepare for this? Well, I too uh, approach it from a quarterly standpoint because uh, you're right. Thinking in terms of something that is a year long process is, is pretty lengthy and it can get lost midway. And so chunking it down to, to uh, quarterly goals and then monitoring the progress on, on a weekly basis is what I admonish. We have a generally have a two day planning session uh, prior to the beginning of the year where we review the past year, our successes and failures and talk about what our priorities are for the coming year. Um, so you, you really kind of think in two, on kind of two elevations. One is what do we want to look like at the end of the year, but also how do we break that down into quarterly progress? And we use the term rocks, which is kind of another term for uh, what do we need to bust up into, uh, into chunks uh, over the next 90 days? And what is the most important, what are the most important things that need to be done in that 90 day period? And that's pretty successful actually. Um, and also, if you really focus on what are the top three items, and of those top three items, what is the number one most important of the three? It's pretty, if you focus, if you approach it from that standpoint, what is the single most important thing we as a firm need to get done over the next 90 days? And you poll the group, uh, it's it's pretty clear, it, it becomes pretty clear uh, pretty quickly as to what that single most important item is. And yet without that process, that single most important item is probably pushed to the side and ignored. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're nearing our end of our time. It's a great conversation. I wish we had more time because we feel like we're just getting started. Um, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll have you back, Mark, and, and continue this conversation again. Um, we really uncovered a, a lot of important things for what somebody needs to think about when they're trying to grow their, their, their business. And it was less about actionable stuff and more about like strategy. Like, how do you, how do you stay the course? How do you, you know, how do you keep moving in the right direction? And I think it's really important. I think it's, um, I think it's, 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 it's a major key in unlocking your success because one of the things that we need to do is we need to be making the time and the space in our calendar to be taking this consistent action, um, to be accountable to that, uh, to be focused on it during that time. And you know, when you do that, I love that face acronym. I'm going to steal it from you. Uh, but when you do that, um, you're going to you're going to ultimately take the actions necessary to really create the growth that you that you're that you're trying to achieve. Um, so. Uh, we covered we covered some really serious and important stuff here for you guys, folks, today. And uh, Mark has has been really incredible in sharing his his knowledge. Uh, Mark, I I always close out the episode with with a couple of things, and uh, one is you know like what is the 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 top piece of advice if you had to choose one piece of advice to share with our audience, what would it be? And then second, uh, if somebody wants to learn more about you, uh, find out what it looks like to work with you, uh, you know maybe ask you know pick your brain on on, on some way. Is, is there somewhere or some place that they can go to continue this conversation? Well, sure. So, so first of all, uh, I'll answer the second question uh, last. It really goes back to your question. What, what piece of advice would I give people? It's really the same piece of advice I gave myself, which you heard me say earlier in the uh, show, uh, focus. In fact, years ago, when I started my last business, I made a large, well, I, first of all, I printed it out and then I took it down to Kinko's and had them enlarge it. And it said, it's all about focus. And I had that matted and framed and hung in my office because I knew that of all people, I was the person that needed to read that the most because I, like a lot of folks, can become enamored with the shiny object. So if someone said to me, what's the first step I need to take in being successful? I would say, sit down and think through what is the most important uh, line of business or activity that interests you and then 
set aside the rest, even if you're tempted, because you cannot focus on more than one or two things at a time. It's just, you can't. And that is antithetical to most professionals who think that they have unlimited capacity and can work endless amounts of hours. So that would be my piece of advice. For those who want to get a hold of me, I would offer to volunteer an hour of coaching uh, free of charge to the first 10 people that would want to uh, reach out to me. And they could contact me either by calling my cell, which is 503-784-7205, or uh, drop me a note at mark at coachrockwell.com. Awesome. Folks, if you didn't catch that, you're out for a run, you're middle of washing the dishes, you're bathing the kids, whatever you're doing while listening to this podcast, we've got you covered. All of those links and uh, especially Mark's cell phone number, we're going to put that out on the internet for everybody to see. Um, that is going to be on our show notes page. Uh, the show notes might show up in your podcast player right below this episode, but if not, go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash and the number of this episode, and that'll take you straight to the show notes page. Um, and there we'll link up everything that was that was shared, including the books that were mentioned, um, at links to those. You can go buy them on Amazon, um, as well as uh, the email and phone number that you can contact Mark on. Uh, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here today. This is a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And um, I'm sure that our listeners got a ton of value from it. Folks, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, we'd love it if you hit the subscribe button. So you got notified every time we release a new episode. We're here twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesdays is uh, me solo behind the microphone, sharing whatever is on my mind at the time. Thursdays, we have guests for you and we bring amazing guests just like Mark uh, to share their wisdom, their knowledge that they've, exper they, they've gathered with years of experience, whatever they do, whatever their specific expertise is. And when you get start taking little pieces of knowledge from each of these guests and putting them together, you will become an unstoppable force. And that's ultimately what we're trying to create here. We're trying to create profitable law firm owners and in the pursuit of profit, uh, we want you to embrace that profit is indeed where you're headed as a firm owner and figure out how to accomplish that, how to scale your firm, how to grow it to the point where you're reaping the benefits, you're working less hours, you're taking home more money, and ultimately have what you envision you would have when you started out with your law firm. So until next time, we'll see you on Tuesday next week. Uh, stay, stay tuned to us. Come back. Listen to us again. We'd love to have you. And uh, yeah, go do, go do what you need to do. One small little piece at a time with absolute focused intensity. Take care. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.